Wow. Last day of 2023. Every time, every year, I, 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 I was convinced that Jesus had to, had to come back by mid 1980s. Um, so obviously, I'm wrong. Remember 2020? The big computer, because uh, the computers couldn't figure out how to change the date, so the world was going to crash. Uh, so we've had many things that have suggested that uh, things are about to close, and it'll be the final time before the return of Jesus. Uh, I think one of the things that stirs us so great in doing this is um, the Bible says that no man knows the day or the hour. Uh, we hate to be told we can't know something. Um, and so we're bent on, I can figure this out. Uh, but I also believe there's an anxiousness uh, to just to go through the hard time of the seven years of tribulation, but knowing that at the end of that, Jesus will return and establish his kingdom for a thousand years here on this earth. And just, I, it's impossible for me anyways, to wrap my brain around living on this earth the way that God always intended it to be under the authority and the reign of Christ. Uh, and so we're longing for that. Um, because very few of us are excited with the current reigning uh, that is taking place in the world. Um, and we're looking forward to when Christ comes. Um, so today we're going to talk about the end times. Um, whenever we go through the end times, I, I don't know who knows what. So I, I, I think it's important to let everyone know that Things are not out of control. Um, the world is changing right now in front of our eyes, and, and many, many people think that things are falling apart. Uh, but the truth is, you guys, things are falling into place. Uh, there is not a chaotic, fingers crossed, let's see where this goes situation in our world. Um, God knows exactly what's going on, uh, and He's in control. And that may anger some of you as far as, well, if he's in control, tell him, knock it off with all this craziness. And if he is God, then, then, you know, um, God does not want us to love him because we have to, uh, God does not want to force us to have a relationship with us. Uh, he wants to have a relationship with us and he wants us to have a relationship with him. Uh, so he's, He's given us tremendous freedom, um, and, and in that, we've messed up, okay? And we do mess up. Um, the world has always gone through big changes, always gone through big changes, and these big changes always come through the shifting of powers and the shifting of authorities and through of different countries and regions and political powers, um, all of these shifting powers and authorities, folks, they all come from God, okay? It, it, again, it is not a fingers crossed, let's hope this goes a particular way. God brings various leaders and authorities. God brings the changes into this world. Uh, he, puts, he puts things in place to fulfill his purpose and his will. Um, referring to God, look what Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2.21. And he, God, changes the times and the season. He removes kings and he raises up kings. Um, the Bible began referring to and emphasizing these different powers and changes back in the time of Daniel, um, which would have been about 600 years before Jesus was even born. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of, Bab of the Babylonian Empire, and the Babylonian Empire had just completely destroyed Israel, Jerusalem, the temple, the city, and taken the children of Israel into captivity. And this was, this was real different for Israel because they were led by God into the land that was promised to them by God. And and they were so much 
against God and worshiping other gods, that God said, I'm going to remove you from the very land that I put you in, and I'm going to put you under uh, slavery or captivity of another nation. And that nation was the Babylonia. And, and then the Lord gave King Nebuchadnezzar a dream, and the dream was of this huge image. Okay, And, and the head of the image was made of gold, and then the, the arms and the chest was made of silver. Uh, the, the belly and the thighs were made of bronze. The legs were made of iron. And his feet and his toes were a combination of mixture of iron and clay. And then the dream ended with a stone not made with hands, meaning man didn't make this stone. Uh, it came from heaven, struck the image in the feet. The image collapsed but it didn't simply collapse. It, it turned to dust and was blown away. And then the mount, I mean, then the rock, the stone that came from heaven turned into a, a mighty mountain. Okay. This stone that was not made by hands or with hands represents the return of Jesus Christ. So the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had went from Nebuchadnezzar, the king, all the way to the return of Christ. So this image represented everything. The, the, from, to, from this dream to the return of Christ. So understand the topic of the end times is nothing new. Okay, it isn't, a lot of people suggest that, well, you know what, the church has made this up. No, 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 not at all. God introduced from here to the end all the way back in the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, 600 years even before Jesus was born. Now, the Lord gave Daniel the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The image with different parts and different materials represented different empires or world powers. The head of gold represented Nebuchadnezzar and, and the, the Babylonian empire, the current, you know, when the dream was given, that's the Babylonian empire. The chest and the arms of silver represented the Medo-Persian Empire, who conquered the Babylonian Empire. The belly and the thighs of bronze represented the Grecian Empire, who conquered the Medo-Persian Empire. And the legs of iron represented the Roman Empire, who crushed the Grecian Empire. Now, and, and you can imagine, at each conquering as each empire would then take control and rise, things would change. The way things were done, uh, the way they looked at things, uh, and everything else, everything changed. These were big, massive changes. And all of these empires are part of history. Okay, But the image describes one more empire that is yet to come into power, and that is the feet and the toes of mixture of iron and clay. The final empire represents the final world power before Christ returns. Okay, it, it, it gives the final, it describes the, the, the feet of, of clay and, and iron, and that's then when the stone not made with hands comes and strikes the image in the feet and, and it all crumbles. So, the toes and the feet represent the final world power before Christ returns. And, and it's made up of 10 leaders uh, represented by the 10 different toes. Uh, we, we can't be absolutely sure how this government will look. Uh, we, we've, we've got some ideas and there's been some suggestions and there's been some interpretations. And, and basically we know that this final empire, there will be, 10 leaders involved. Will it be 10 countries? Will it be 10 individuals? Um, we're not really positive. Okay. But understand that this will be the end and this will be the final and this will be not a regional empire. This will be a world empire. This idea is that this final world power, this final empire um, will rule the world not just a region. So because of all the disorder and disruptions and wars and world wars, um, world leaders for years have been discussing this 
and putting this idea into place. There's got to be, there's got to be a world government. Okay, there's been various attempts. The UN, the United Nations, was this idea of policing the world, and yeah, they've done a bang up job, haven't they? Um, you know that didn't work, and and then you've got NATO, who is in Europe because that's where the world wars took place over in Europe, and they've struggled in what they're doing, and 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 the funny thing, I guess it's not funny. The bad thing is all of the struggles are in the leadership. Have you noticed that? Uh, it's not the people, it's the leaders who think, I'm a leader. And therefore, they think that they can make amazing decisions and they have tremendous insight, which is foolish. Um, so this final world government, there'll be 10 leaders involved. There'll be one that rises out of the 10. There always has to be a leader. Okay, I mean, marriage is... How many are involved in a marriage? Two, right? Ever have disagreements? Anybody married? You ever had a disagreement with one another? Haven't you? Yes. And there's just two of you, okay? And you're just running your household, right? Okay, now let's have 10 people run the world. Think there'll be some problems? Yeah, I think so. So there will be a leader that will come out of these 10 that will... I guess in simple terms, we can say the other nine is like his board, okay? He goes for advice and, and what have you. It will be a strong world power, which is represented by the iron. Iron's strong and tough. The Roman Empire crushed the world. They just came in and smashed everything, okay? They just, bam, took control, okay? So this will be a, a strong, you know, government. But it will also be weak as it is represented by the clay that is mixed in with the iron. Um, this world power is the very power that will be in power when Jesus returns. And he is the stone, the very stone that is made without hands, and he will destroy uh, the world powers and he will establish his kingdom on earth that will reign for a thousand years here on earth. So that's the basic interpretation of, of the, the vision or the, the image that Daniel saw or Nebuchadnezzar saw. Each of these empires brought, brought tremendous change to the world as each world power ruled differently. Okay, and, and, and I mentioned that as far as, you know, each one, Nebuchadnezzar ran it one way, then the Medo-Persians changed and ran it their way, and then the Grecians, and then the, the Romans, and, and this you know, it caused great change in the world. But as time passed, there were changes in each of these empires, which led to their fall and a new empire taking over them. When, when a different king took control after the, death, after the death of Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he had a, a son that took over who died quickly, and then he had a he was killed by his brother-in-law, and, and then he had a brother-in-law who took over, and, and, and so things began to change. And, and, and in those changes, there were political struggles and different opinions and different ideas, which led to divisions, which then weakened that empire and made them vulnerable to the up-and-coming power. Nobody overthrew Nebuchadnezzar. He was powerful. They suggest the most powerful king and leader of the world. He, but when he died, the next guy wasn't quite as strong, nor was the guy after that, nor the guy after that. And then they had divisions and opinions and changes which made them weak, which then enabled the Medo-Persians to conquer them. The Medo-Persians was a double the Medes and the, and, and, and the Persians and you know, they struggled and they began to have different kings and then they got weak and, and hence that goes. And we're familiar with Rome as far as they just conquered the world, got bored with themselves and said, well, I know, let's play games. Uh, and so they, they did the Colosseum, which made them weak. They weren't a tentative or, or control. And, and so this is what happens. A, a, a power comes in and then new leaders raise up and 
different ideas and opinions and struggles and divisions, and it makes you weak. We're watching this happen in America now. As a new world power is, is on the rise, we're watching America just kind of melt in front of our very eyes. A lot has happened in the world since the collapse of the Roman Empire, but this final world power described in Nebuchadnezzar's dreams has not yet come into, into power. And as it does come into power, there will be visible changes to the world leading up to the final power. Things will change. What we're familiar with and used to. You hear a lot of people talking about, you know, the good old days or the best generation in, in America and, and other countries. Well, what's changing? Leadership. And the leaders are changing. I believe this final world power is being set up right now before our very eyes. And we're seeing great changes take place in the world as it is being set up. Now, here's the interesting thing. The world leaders of today, they believe that they are the ones setting everything in order to accomplish the goal of their world power. They really do. They, they do get together. There are meetings that you and I have no idea about, okay, of not necessarily government leaders, but financial leaders, wealthy leaders. Um, you know, we understand that people with a lot of money believe that they control. And money can buy you stuff. Um, and so they really do believe that they got this. Okay? They, they really do believe that they know what they're doing and they know what's best. And, and so they're, we're watching all of these world leaders and country leaders and, and territory leaders and financial leaders. And they really do believe that they are in control. But the truth is, God is in control. And God is setting things into place. And he's setting things into place for the return of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus comes, he will destroy all world powers. And he will establish his kingdom on earth. Remember Daniel 2.21. God removes kings. God raises kings up. So. All of the elections that are won and lost, all of the backroom deals and lies and deceptions that are taking place, God is aware of them all. And he's allowing them to accomplish, this is the crazy part, to accomplish God's will, his will. That's, that fascinates me. When I'm in control of something, I want to be in complete control. I determine who goes where, who says what, who does what, because I'm, I'm going towards this goal. I'm going towards this. And I have to be in control of all that. God says, I'll let them think they're in control. I'll let them make all of the decisions, and I'll work with their decisions. And they have no idea they're doing exactly what I want them to do. So he's allowing things to what we consider fall apart so that things will be put into place and fall into place. And always remember, God's will is for Christ to return and establish his kingdom forever. This is where the world is heading. If anybody asks you, where's this world heading? It's heading towards the return of Christ to establish his kingdom here on earth that will reign forever. That's where it's going. So the world is changing. Powers are shifting as, as things are falling into place and the final world power is, is rising. There are some visible changes that we, I want to talk about this morning. Um, I don't believe that God does things secretly. He does things openly for all to see. He even tells us what is going to happen before it happens so that when it happens, we'll know it's him that's doing it. So. Never believe that, you know, or question, where is God in the midst of all this? You know, why is he allowing this to happen? He's allowing things to fall into place, to fulfill his will, to bring Christ here. And he's told us, this is what it's going to look like. Okay, there's going to be, a, when, when you see a world power come in and their goal and, um, attempt and 
will be to control the world, then you know that we're extremely close. And you can probably go out into the streets today and ask people, what do you think of a one power ruling the world? And most would probably say, great idea. I'm tired of this bickering and fighting amongst each other and who's on top and who's stronger. And it would be great if there was an individual or a specific power or government that ran the world. That would be, that's a good idea. I can remember years ago, years ago, years ago, um, um, uh, sharing with somebody at work. Uh, about the end times and the antichrist and i i shared all the drama and the dramatics and everything else and and, and I, you know the antichrist take it over and he looks at me and goes well that's that sounds good and i no it's not good i described the mark of the beast and and in all this and he's going, yeah yeah in his mind yeah we'll get rid of all this stealing and robbery and you know and and fights amongst nations and and yeah, that it, it sounded good. So the world will be open to this, but there's some visible changes that are happening in our world right now that I, I think it's important for you and I to focus on. Okay. First, we're seeing the leadership and the influence of America in the world is fading quickly and drastically as. America morally and spiritually is falling apart from the inside out. Okay, it's the leadership. And again, as I mentioned to you, all the changes of world power, the collapse of the world powers always come from the leadership, the inside. And so we're watching the influence of America, and, and, and the influence of America was freedom and and a government run by the people, and you make choices, and you vote in individuals, and, and, and uh, you know, is it a perfect government? No, the only perfect government will be when Jesus is here, and he's governing the world. But it, it's, you know, we're the only country that people are fighting to get into, okay? Um, why? Because they recognize, though it's not perfect, you can make something of yourself and you have opportunities and it's not just the this people or that people. And so, but we're watching the influence and the leadership of America in this world is fading. And, and it's because of America morally and spiritually falling apart and going downhill quick. It, it's, it's crazy the things that America is doing. It doesn't make sense, the decisions that America is making. It, it, it's just, it's bizarre. It's, it's bizarre to see what our leadership is putting before us and telling us. It, it just, it makes no sense. And, and there's, you know, we see that they're, they're eliminating free speech because you can't talk about where they're going and what they want because any person with a brain can figure out this ain't right so you can't talk about it you can't have a discussion about it if you've ever tried to discuss some of these current ideas and goals with somebody all they do is get mad and call you names and, and then if you don't be quiet they start threatening you so that shuts it down so you can't talk about it you know it, it's just it, it's just insane to watch all this unfold in front of us and it's we're watching day by day we're watching the collapse of america on the other hand the leadership and influence of china is rising in the world okay they china is not a good nation to follow okay unless you're extremely wealthy but the way they treat the people there is cruelty like we can't even imagine. A lot of it's even hidden from the news, so we don't know. And if you say what's really going on, then you're marked as a troublemaker. Chinese President Xi on Tuesday, this week, vowed that Taiwan will be 
absolutely reunited with the mainland and saying that Beijing will absolutely prevent anyone from splitting them away from one another. That's a pretty bold statement. And understand, Taiwan and the United States are allies. And yet, Xi is letting the United States know that they are going to do this. We will absolutely have Taiwan become a part of China. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. So, does that sound like America is the controlling influence and power of the world? No, it doesn't. Who does it sound like is pushing themselves up? It's, uh, it's, it's China. China has been very smart in what they've done. Uh, I don't know. I can't say wise. I'll just say smart. They knew enough about America that they love money. Americans love money. So if we offer them money, we got them. That's your sports figures who are deep involved with China. That's our government officials who are deep in, 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 with, in controlled by China. And why are they? They get money from China. And so to get mad at China, you, you hurt your own wallet. So you don't say anything. There, there's an actor, I don't remember his name, I wouldn't tell you what it was anyways, because I, I just, every time I see his face in my head, I just get angry. But he was in a movie that said something against China, and then he does a, a YouTube video to send to China, and he's, he's, he's known as a, um, what do they call those big old strong guys, superhero type of guys, anyways, he's, he's a macho kind of guy. And, and he's very muscular. I, I think he used to be a wrestler, but I don't know for sure. Uh, but it shows him making this little uh, YouTube video, and he's almost in tears. I am so, 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 so sorry. I am, I am so, so, so sorry, China, for what I said. I, I, am, I am so wrong. I, I, please, please. And then he even speaks in Chinese to let him know how sorry he is. And, and I just think, he can't be a superhero no more. He just proved himself to be a big baby. Okay, he's, he's whining and apologizing for the statement he made in a movie that he didn't write, but it offended China. And, and this is because he knows his career could be crumbled. So, so they, they knew America can be bought. China also has known that most of the world can be bought. That's why they've put themselves in great debt, not just with America, but with everybody else giving money because that's, you know, so if you speak against China, what will they do? They will cut you off. And if they cut you off, what will that mean? You're going to struggle. So they, they've done this knowingly what they were doing. And they're just running around controlling the world. We, on the other hand, we don't want to get anybody mad. We don't want to upset anybody. We don't want to come against anybody. You know, okay, so you've, so you've sent missiles and bombs and over a hundred times at our military bases. I don't want to cause a ruckus here. We'll go bomb a couple of your buildings, okay? So that, not you, your buildings and that, you know. So nobody's fearful. Nobody's intimidated. Nobody's concerned about America's position, but they are China's because they can financially. They're not threatened militarily. They're threatening financially. It's cost them great. Their economy is pretty messed up, but they have tremendous control. The war in Russia and Ukraine, as it heads into its third year, has become the biggest and bloodiest war in Europe since World War II. Things are just falling apart over there. And please understand that there is more corrupt politics involved in America's financial support of Ukraine than we will ever know. It sounds good on the outside. Well, of course we have to give them money to buy bombs or give them bombs. If we don't, then Russia will defeat them. And if Russia defeats them, they won't stop there. They'll take over all of the NATO, and, and, and this is what will be taking place. And so... We just keep pouring money into it. 
And here's the crazy thing. They don't have to give account for a penny. Well, they don't have to tell America those billions and billions of dollars where to go. None of your business. None of your business. It's like, you know, if, if the bank takes some of your money and you go and you go, hey, what was this? It's none of your business what we did with it. Okay, we, we needed it, and so we took it to help our bank. It's none of your business what we did with it. That's what they're telling us. And so we're watching the financial squeeze on America, which is part of bringing America down. We're watching the confusion and the strife and the struggling over in, in, in Europe. Ukraine isn't, they're known for their corruption, you guys. They are known as one of the most corrupt nations in the world. So don't think, like, oh, you know what, poor little Ukraine. I feel for the people, don't misunderstand me. But again, it's the leadership doing all of this. And it's going towards a collapse. Putin foolishly believes that he's going to be the ruler of the world. He ain't. Uh, President Xi thinks he's going to be the wor- ruler of the world. He ain't. Um, the, the crazy guy in North Korea thinks he's going to be the leader of the world. Oh, trust me, he ain't. But you can see where things are just stirring up. But the change I want to focus on the most is what's happening right now in Israel. America has been an instrument in God's hands in this world, but it's never been about America. Americans have a hard time understanding that. We always, you know, the biggest, oh, how come, how come America is not in the Bible? Because we are extremely important, are we not? Why isn't America? Because that's how we see ourselves. We see ourselves as the leading important factor of the world. But it's never been about America. Just like Babylon was an instrument in God's hands, but it was never about Babylon. It is and always has been about God and the people in the nation of Israel, the ones that he made his covenant with. After the nation of Israel was destroyed and the people taken into captivity to Babylon, the Lord prophesied through Ezekiel that he would someday bring them back. He would, this isn't forever. I will bring you back to the land of Israel, which was completely, Completely and absolutely and totally destroyed. We read in Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 33. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all of your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So that they will say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Then in chapter 37 of Ezekiel, God describes that he will, he will breathe life back into Israel. Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 1, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. And then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open field, and indeed they were very dry bones. That means they've they're dead, 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 dead. They're dry. They're, they're just, they're almost dust. Verse three, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And so I answered, oh Lord, you know, a wise answer, Ezekiel. Uh, and again, verse four, and again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, 
and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And jump down to verse 11 of Ezekiel 37. And it, he says, and then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry. Our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from the grave and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and, and brought you up from the graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. I will place you in your own land and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it says the Lord. This prophecy was given hundreds of years before Israel became a nation, but these prophecies of Ezekiel 36 and 37 began to be fulfilled when Israel became a nation again on May 14, 1948. Since they became a nation in 1948, Israel has been developing from swampland and desert land into a beautiful, productive nation. Israel is one of the top in providing vegetation and fruit and things of the world, education, technology. But please know, when people would pass by the land that is currently Israel, before Israel took control, it was swampy desert land. It was not like people walking by and going, hey, I, I wonder how much this land costs. No, it was swampy desert land. And just as God promised, it has now become like the Garden of Eden. Ruin, ruined cities are now fortified and strong. So God has fulfilled Ezekiel 36 and 37. But that's not the end of Israel. It doesn't end with Israel in this glorified state. Because as you go on in Ezekiel 38, Israel is attacked by Russia and other nations. And we're watching right now, um, Russia's made some opinions and statements about the Middle East. And, and Israel's not in their favor. Israel is not their friend or buddy. Since since the brutal and barbaric attack on Israel, Israeli civilians on October 7th by Hamas, the anti-Semitism and hatred for Jews has been exposed. They have always, the Jewish people have always dealt with anti-Semitism, but not to where it is today. I was talking to Jason on the way in, and, and, and I, I saw on the news this morning that there are flyers going around Seattle uh, that are saying, um, stop the fun uh, for Palestine. And so their plans are to disrupt the New Year's Eve fest you know, festival that's going to be taking place. It's on the internet, it's passed it out on the streets. And, 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 and so they're, they're in favor of Hamas, who brutally horrifyingly, barbarically slaughtered civilians in Israel. And so we're beginning to see the hatred to the Jews rising, and some people are acting shocked. I, I you know, one of the colleges, Harvard a, a alumni said, this isn't new. I, they were anti-Jews when I was going in and graduating. It's just worse. And it's now out in the open. And the hard part, you guys, people were watching people turn against Israel for defending themselves. Um, and, and it's growing worse as Israel defends themselves because Hamas has said, oh no, we're going to do it again. The, the, you know, we're not like, okay, sorry for October 7th. And we're not like, okay, we're satisfied with October 7th. Oh no, no. We are and will do it again. 
And so Israel understands they have to eliminate Hamas. Can you imagine, I mean, your neighbors, their goal in life is to absolutely and to totally destroy you and you let them live there? But because Israel is, has vowed that they will eliminate Hamas, okay, at least get them out of, away from Gaza, um, the more of the world is hating them because they have to go in there. And Hamas is using civilians as their shield. Their headquarters are under hospitals and under schools and, 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 and everything else. And so, you know, there are civilians, which is horrible. In, in all wars, civilians die. That's why wars are so horrible. But more and more people are hating Israel and turning against Israel. I, I, am, I am happy but shocked that our president has not turned against Israel. Um, thank God it's an election year so that, you know, he, he feels he has to do a couple of things right. Um, but we're watching the world hate Israel. This growing hatred of Jews, I believe, will encourage, will encourage nations to attack Israel, which are described in Ezekiel 38. The Bible, in Ezekiel 38, God says that he will put hooks in the jaws of Magog and Russia and pull them into it. And we've always tried, you know what is oil? Well, you know what is finance? Well, you know what? Is, we don't know what those hooks are, and God has chosen not to tell us, which bothers us, so we have to make guesses. But being angry at Israel could be the very hook to pull all the, yeah, you know, we need to stop. They're just slaughtering the Palestinians. And so this could be the very hook that God uses to pull in these nations to attack Israel. So Israel has been extremely successful and blessed since 1948 is when it began. And they've worked hard all these years. But we read in Ezekiel 39 that God gives Israel the victory over all these nations that attack them. God will actually give that little Israel the victory. And when that happens, there will obviously bring, this will obviously bring major chaos to the world. This is not what anybody expects. And it'll bring chaos because nations will be destroyed. Chaos will arise. Which I, this is me, I believe this will then bring about the opportunity for the final world power to make their move to take control of the world. I mean, when, when this unfolds, when Ezekiel 39, 38 and 39 unfolds, and, and, and so much of the population or the nations and the people are destroyed by Israel, the world will say, it's time. It's time. We, we can't do this no more. Which would then be the beginning of the final seven years of great tribulation before Jesus returns. Revelation chapter 6 describes the beginning and all of the great tribulation. But it begins by talking and, and, and describing the seven seals that are open. Revelation 6, 1 and 2 says, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. A white horse is ridden by a victorious conqueror. I believe the rider of this white horse in Revelation 6-2 is the Antichrist as he begins his march of conquest and conquering. Please know that when the Antichrist comes to power, it's not going to be like everybody's going to go, okay. No, it's go he's going to have to go out and conquer and, and fight. Okay, in, in Revelation chapter 19, uh, after the seven years of tribulation, Jesus does come on a white horse as the victorious conqueror. That's at the end of the seven years, at the end of the great tribulation. But at the beginning of the seven years tribulation, it's the Antichrist who comes on the white horse and conquers and takes control of the world. 
And because of the, the wars from the Antichrist, uh, the opening of the remaining seals described in Revelation 6 describe the devastation. And it says that peace will be removed and people will be killing each other and that economy will fall and, and, and so bad that a living will be extremely expensive and difficult. And it, it describes that one-fourth of the world's population will die. And, and those who turn to God and, and will not obey the authority and the rule of the government, they will be martyred for Christ. And there'll be great disasters and earthquakes will hit the earth. And then, after all of that, it gets really bad. Okay, if that's not bad enough, that's just the opening door of, here we go. But it will begin, I believe, when Israel is attacked in Ezekiel 38, and God gives them the victory. So keep your eye on Israel. Because what is happening there right now is causing other nations to turn away from them, leaving Israel alone and hated and vulnerable. Which again, could lead to the attack of the other nations described in Ezekiel 38. But the mistake of these other nations is Israel's not alone. Israel has God. And God will give them the victory. The nations that come against Israel don't believe in the God of Israel. They will, but they don't. So their mistake is they think Israel is alone and abandoned. And they're not. God will fight. God will give them the victory. So listen, even though things are getting really hard and scary, you can see, you can see that things are falling into place as God leads the world towards the return and the reign of Christ. But even though the future of the world is getting pretty scary, there's a way of escape from this horrible great tribulation that is coming. I believe the Bible teaches us that the Lord will remove his church before the great tribulation. This is We refer to this as the rapture of the church. The word rapture is not found in the Bible, but 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, then, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The Latin word used for caught up is raptura, where we get our word rapture. The great tribulation, you guys, is God's wrath poured out on this world for the final seven years before Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. The great tribulation is described in great detail in the book of Revelation. It's, it's not a pretty scene. Have you ever had the thought or heard someone say, well, where is God and all? How come God's letting everybody get away with stuff? Oh, he won't. We will give an, ex give an answer for our failures and sins as a world. God's wrath will come upon this world. God's wrath was poured out in the flood. God's wrath was poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah. God's wrath has been poured out at different times in this world. And that's the final wrath of God. I believe that all Christians will be caught up or raptured to be with the Lord before the Great Tribulation. Some believe that the rapture will take place in the middle of the Tribulation three and a half years, and then gone, and then the final really bad three and a half years. They are referred to as mid-tribbers. Mid-trib. Mid-tribbers. I make up words. Some believe that the rapture takes place after the Great Tribulation. Those are post-trib. They believe that after the seven years, Christians will go through, the church will go through the Tribulation, and then God will call them home. I believe and teach we will be raptured before the tribulation, which would be considered pre-trib, before it happens. I believe we, the church, will not face the wrath of God. I believe that because of Christ, we've been cleansed and forgiven. We've been delivered from the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
God doesn't want anyone to face his wrath. God doesn't want anyone to go through the great tribulation. And so he's provided a way out. And that's Christ. The time of the great tribulation is God's wrath poured out on the world because of, of sin. But again, I believe that all Christians have been saved from the wrath of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to be concerned or afraid of the wrath of God. Yes, Jesus warned us that we would face persecution. That's people. God's wrath is totally different. When someone says you're a fool for being a Christian and punches you in the nose, that's tribulation. That's not God's wrath. God didn't tell that person, go punch him in the nose. That's, that's tribulation. That's, that's people. That's people's angers and people's wrath. God's wrath is described a few times in the Bible, and it looks quite scarier than a punch in the nose. The way of escape from the wrath of God against all sin is to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus was born. We just celebrated his birthday. That's why Jesus died on the cross for our sin. That's why Jesus rose from the grave to give us victory over the grave. Jesus came to break the chains of the bondage of sin and to give us hope, hope of salvation and eternal life. Hebrews tells us that this hope is a, an anchor to our soul. An anchor holds you in place. It keeps you from drifting. And, and, and this is what he says. Listen, Hebrews is telling us that's what God is. We have this hope in Christ. He has delivered us. He has cleansed us. He has forgiven us. He has promised us eternal life. He has promised us to be in his presence. He has promised us that we, we will not face the wrath of God. That's our hope. That's what we focus on. So listen, folks. I'm not trying to be a doomsdayer, but this coming year, looks like it's going to be pretty tough. Looks like it's even going to be scary. But our hope is in Christ. And that hope is the anchor to our soul. That's what we look upon. Don't look at the scary things in the world. God, let us know straight up, it's going to be bad before Jesus returns. So don't look at that. Look at me. Focus on him. He's our anchor. He's who will keep us from drifting, even in the midst of a storm. You drop that anchor, you're solid, you're, you're secure, you're not drifting. So Christ is who we want to focus on. Christ is who we want to cling to. He has delivered us. We will not go through the great tribulation because he's already paid the price and we've already accepted that he's paid the price for us. We've already recognized and proclaimed him to be the Lord of our life. We've already admitted and, and proclaimed that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. We've admitted and accepted and follow all of that. But God has warned us in his word. Before he comes, it's going to be bad. God's wrath will be poured, but we can escape that through Christ. And he's the only one that can get us to, or, or enable us to escape the very wrath of God. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and thank you for your mercy and your grace. It is not because we deserve it. It is not because we've been good. It is not because we've figured something out. It is because you love us, and we accept your love, and we're humbled by your love, and we surrender to your love. So, Father, as we worship you now, Father, may you stir our hearts and touch our hearts, Lord, that we may, we may recognize, Lord, that, that you've told us where things are going. You've told us all the way back to King Nebuchadnezzar what it's going to look like, what it's going to be, the difficulties, the ugliness of it, the brutality of it. But you've always also told us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. By coming to him, we can be saved from all of our sins and all that unfolds. So, Father, as we worship you now, Father, we lift up our hearts of thanksgiving. We lift up our hearts and our voices of worship and praise. We surrender all to you, Lord. Father, we do lift up our offering as we give it unto you as a part of our worship. We do, Father, pray that you will 
bless the bread and the cup as we remember that this life that we have in Christ, this freedom that we have from your wrath was through the very suffering of Christ. And so we remember, Father, and we pray that you would bless. We pray, Father, that as we worship you now, our hearts will be stirred. Our lives will be surrendered. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. <laughs>